Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the second lecture for the first week. So this is the second lecture for chapter one. So in this lecture, we're going to start diving more deeply into the specific objection objectives of the chapter and some of the things that the chapter discusses. So terminology, concepts, things like that. So again, I will share my PowerPoint with you. Don't forget that you can also open the PowerPoint at any point you want and download it. Some people like to actually write their notes right on it. You can print it, whatever you want to do. The PowerPoint is also available for you in Brightspace. So we are going to talk about some of the specific concepts in chapter one today. Uh, so I always start with a quote, or a lot of times I start with a quote, and one of this quote says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So we are in a class called criminal justice. So one of the main things that we need to talk about is the concept of justice. This is saying if there's injustice anywhere in the world, it actually causes a threat to justice everywhere. So we need to ask ourselves, what is justice? What is the concept of justice? Well, it's kind of one of those things that's often hard to actually define. If somebody says, what is truth? What is justice? Sometimes it's hard to give a specific definition for those things. It's kind of this you know, thing, it's just, you know what it is. Well, in the book, they define it as the principles of fairness or moral equity. So fairness, equity, how do we have a system that is just, that is fair? So that is the basic concept or definition that we're going to give to the term justice. It basically means fairness or equity for all. So that's the core term justice. So then we have to ask ourselves, what is social justice? And social justice is that fairness or equity and cultural beliefs of what's right and wrong within society. So it's what we define as a society as fair or equitable, okay? So you hear a lot of times people talk about social justice now. That's a big concept right now. We talk about a lot in the news. So it means what is the fairness within our society? What does society view as fair? So then there's other terms that are placed with the, the, the definition of justice. You have civil justice and you have criminal justice. So civil justice is fairness or equity in the civil system. So the civil system is a system that we use to settle disputes between people. Okay, so civil law is settling disputes between two people. You have a will, who gets the uh, items from the will. You have somebody buy property, it's negotiating the sale of the property. Um, you have a uh, <clears throat> civil lawsuit, somebody sues somebody else. You're negotiating what's gonna happen with that. That's all civil justice. It's a one person or company versus another person or company. And it's civil. And generally, you're talking about money in civil cases. Criminal justice is a little different. Criminal justice is the government versus a person. So it's our government seeking to enforce a law, a criminal law against another person. So in a civil case, if it's the title of a case, it's probably like two people's names, Smith versus Jones where criminal justice cases are going to be the state, either the real state or the federal state. So it could be New York versus Jones, or it could be um, United States versus Jones. It's the federal government or the state government going after somebody for violating the law. So remember the term justice is still part of that fairness. So civil justice is the fairness in that civil system. And criminal justice is that fairness in that criminal system, fairness and equity in those systems. So I have posted a video in your chapter one discussion that's called Defining Justice. It's not too long. It's um, a crash course video, which are, they're all really, really good. And it really delves into this concept of what is justice and really gets you thinking about the term justice. So you should watch that video prior to participating in your chapter one discussion. So 
to get you thinking more about it, I have this scenario. Dale and Mike are twin brothers and best friends. They spend their entire lives looking out for each other's interests. They grow up, they're inseparable, they play sports together, they double date, they go to the same college. Um, they go closer as they age. They both got married at the same time, eventually got divorced. Um, after they retire, they decide to live together to save some money. When 70-year-old Mike is diagnosed with cancer, doctors predict that he only has about six months to live. The brothers agree that Mike should not suffer, so Mike and Dale both write and sign a note stating that they decided to commit suicide. Dale broke 20 tranquilizers into Mike's evening meal and watched as he ate it. Yet when Dale checked on Mike one hour later, Mike was still alive. Dale panicked to take a 38 caliber revolver from his desk and shot Mike, killing him. Dale then went to the kitchen, took a handful of tranquilizers and did not die. He woke up the next morning as someone was pounding on the front door. It was a neighbor seeing that Dale was dazed and confused. He called the ambulance and the police. So that's your scenario. And this would be the same scenario that we use in the chapter one discussion. So I retyped it so you'll see it there, but this is what you're going to talk about. So my question to you is, what do you think? So the first one I want you to think about, if you were the prosecutor, the prosecutor is the one that works for the government who's in charge of enforcing the law. So bringing people to trial and trying to prove that they're guilty of a crime. So if you were the prosecutor, what do you, th and your job is to enforce the laws, what would you argue would be justice in this case against Dale? What do you think should happen to Dale in order to assure justice? Okay, so kind of think of it from the prosecutor, the state's perspective. And then I want you to switch. What if you were Dale's attorney and you're talking to Dale and you're hearing Dale talk about what happened to his brother and how he was trying to keep him from pain, being, dying a painful death and how they agreed. If you were his defense attorney, you're defending him, what would you think would be just? What would be the just result? What should happen to Dale so that justice is served? Okay. So I want you to think about it from both perspectives. So how is justice served in that case? So that's what you're going to do for your discussion. Now, you're only going to pick one person. You're either going to be the prosecutor or the defense or the judge. And then you're going to explain what you think would be just in that case to make fairness and equity in society. One of the things I hope you'll see is that justice often means different things to different people depending how they see it. So a lot of times my students think, well, what's the right answer? Tell me the answer, which one's just? Well, who's the right side? And in the law, you're gonna quickly learn that there's never just one side. There's always two sides and two arguments. And that's why we have a criminal justice system, what we call an adversarial system, the prosecutor versus defense. And they do get out to reach justice or fairness in that situation. But both would have a valid argument of what they think should happen that would be just. And they may be completely different sides. And a lot of times people's idea of justice depends on how they view the whole entire criminal justice system. Some people believe that the whole purpose of the criminal justice system is to protect society against crime. Okay, so some people view that the system is set up and its purpose is to protect society. Other people view the criminal justice system as there to protect people's constitutional rights, that we have this big um, government that you know, can control so much, but we need as a system to assure that our constitutional protections that are in the Bill of Rights are upheld. That's what makes justice. So you have this balance. We need to protect society from crime and maintain social order, but we also have to uphold people's constitutional individual rights. And how do we do both of these things in order to reach justice? So Thomas Jefferson once said, I'd rather be exposed to the inconveniences attending too much liberty than those attending too small of a degree. 
So I want you to think about what he's saying. What do you think he means? What is he saying about our liberty? Does he think we should have more liberty, that we are individual rights should be the main focus of justice? Or is he saying we should more focus on crime control? That is the big debate within the criminal justice system. There are two different models on how um, the criminal justice system should function, okay? So I'm going to ask you some questions and I want you and I want you to answer these questions, okay? So I will read the questions and on your paper, I want you to give what you think the answer should be. Okay, so I will share the quiz with you and then we'll look through it and you can answer it the way that you think it should be. Okay, so here is your pre your, your um, pre-quiz. Number one, answer each of these true or false. The continual rise in the crime rate is a significant issue in society. The continual rise in the crime rate is a significant issue in society, true or false. Number two, generally people do not suffer, uh, receive stiff enough punishments for crimes they commit, true or false. Three, police should be able to do whatever is necessary to catch a murderer, true or false. Number four, it is okay to violate someone's rights once in a while as long as the crime is solved and the person is arrested. True or false. Number five, police abuse of power is a significant issue in society. True or false. Number six, generally people receive too harsh a punishment for certain crimes, especially drug crimes. True or false. Seven, it is never acceptable to violate someone's constitutional rights. True or false? Number eight, if a person has not read their Miranda rights prior to an interrogation, any confession obtained should be excluded from trial as evidence, even if that means the person should not, would not be convicted. True or false? If you aren't read your Mirandas during an interrogation, the confession should be thrown out, can't use it against them, even if it means the person will go free. True or false? Okay, now there really is no right or wrong answer to these questions. It is how you perceive the system. So for number one, a continual rise in the crime rate is a significant issue. If you wrote true for that, you tend to be more focused on protecting society, okay? If you, so the next one, people, uh, generally people do not receive stick enough punishments. Again, you would lean more towards protecting society. Police should be able to do whatever they want to catch a murderer you are leaning more towards protecting society. Number four, it's okay to violate someone's rights once in a while, as long as you solve crime, you lean more towards protecting society. Number five, police abuse is a significant issue. You're more towards individual rights, if you wrote true to that. Number six, generally people receive too harsh a punishment for certain crimes you would lean more towards individual rights if you wrote true. Number seven, it is never acceptable to violate someone's constitutional rights. If you wrote true, you lean more towards individual rights. And number eight, if you get a confession and it violated Miranda, you gotta let the person, you gotta kick out the confession even if it means the person goes free, you are more towards individual rights. Okay, so why the heck are we doing this? Because you are sort of weighing where you stand on the issue of the criminal justice system. So when you look at the entire criminal justice system, there are two models or views of the criminal justice system. So you have people that believe in what we call the due process model. The due process model is the belief that 
individual rights are the sole main focus, should be the sole main focus of the criminal justice system. That those rights were given to us in the Bill of Rights to protect us from the government. And they should be the most important overriding things in our system. So the whole system should be focused on protecting individual rights. So if you believe in individual rights over everything else, then you believe in the due process model. You're an individual rights advocate and you believe in the due process model. Now, if you think maintaining order and social control is the most important thing, you are a public order advocate. You are advocating for public order and then you believe in the crime control model. You believe that the criminal justice system is set up to maintain social order and maintain public order. So stopping crime is the most important focus for you of the criminal justice system. Now, some of you may have had half and half, which is a good thing. You really want a balance in the system. So don't panic if you're that. But this just kind of gives you an idea of which way you are in your beliefs. There's no right or wrong answer. One of these isn't better than the other. There's just two different ways, two different theories of what the purpose of the criminal justice system is. And so you have to decide independently which way you think about the system. So let's test your knowledge and see if you understand the differences. There is a practice assessment that I posted online. So remember, practice assessments are not quizzes towards your grade. They're just ways to review to see if you understand. So let me give you an example. If I say we have three strikes in your outlaws, those are laws that say if you commit three violent felonies, your sentence, no matter what, is life in prison without getting out ever. OK, if you believe in those types of laws, you are more crime control, right? Um, Miranda, like the example I gave you, if you believe Miranda and the right to have your rights read to you is the most important thing, then you are more due process. So you can go online, you can take that practice assessment and you can just see, are you understanding the distinction between the two models? Now let's put this in action. Let's think about how it works in the criminal justice system. Right now, one of our big concerns in society is terrorism. And how do we stop terrorism? Well, creating policies and procedures to stop terrorism often causes or often leads to some of our civil rights being infringed on, right? So I often have students say, I don't care if they listen to my phone calls, I have nothing to hide. I don't care if they search my house, I don't have anything to hide. Understanding when you say that you are giving up a constitutional right that you have. The Fourth Amendment says the government cannot search unreasonably without probable cause and a warrant. You are handing that away, you're giving that up something you have as an individual right, and you're willing to give that up in the name of stopping terrorism. So often there's this balance in the criminal justice system. We need to stop terrorism. And sometimes the policies and laws created to stop terrorism often infringe or take away from some of our constitutional rights. So that's what you have to think about. Are you willing to give up some of your constitutional rights in the name of stopping terrorism. So that is your chapter one assignment. So I posted a video, can terrorism destroy democracy? Because remember our democracy is based on us having these individual rights. So it kind of goes through two different perspectives on terrorism and democracy. It's a little old, I understand. But really, just to get you thinking of that balance, how do we reach that balance between stopping crime, but still ensuring that we do have these constitutional rights? OK, and that is the theme of the whole criminal justice system. The whole idea of the criminal justice system is to reach a balance. So if you were one of those people that kind of had half and half, that's probably a good thing. You're trying to reach a balance in the system. Remember, justice is fairness. So we want a fairness between individual rights and stopping crime in our society. We need that balance. 
And everything in the system is set up to reach that balance. And that's the whole theme of the criminal justice class. We have police to stop crime, but how do those police, what responsibility do they have to protect individual rights? We have courts to convict people and punish them if they commit a crime, but how do we balance that against individual rights? So we're always trying to reach that balance and that's gonna be the theme of the whole class. So I told you in the last lecture, I was gonna ask you many, many times throughout the semester, what are the three parts of the criminal justice system? And the three parts of the criminal justice system are police, courts, and corrections. And that's what we're gonna look at throughout the whole year. So we said these components are there to maintain social order, and they're also there to ensure justice because we are not gonna have social order if we don't have justice, right? A threat of injustice anywhere threatens justice everywhere. And so we need justice in order to maintain social order. These three parts of our system work together to try to ensure that justice and social order, okay? Now, when we think about these three parts, police, courts, and corrections, they are three distinct parts of the system. They all have their own duties and responsibilities. We're gonna look at those throughout the semester. And they all sort of compete for limited resources. There's only so much money the government can give towards the criminal justice system that has to be divided up between the three parts of the system. So we know they all want to be, create justice and social order, but they also have to share resources. So the question is how well do they get along? We have these three distinct parts, but how do they get along? Some people believe that they do cooperate and work together well in order to reach justice. So the police are gonna work close with the courts, are gonna work close with corrections, and they're all gonna be civil and work together in order to reach justice. Other people see it that they're really competing for these limited resources, and they may have different political views on what should happen to crime. And if they do, if police aren't on the same page as the courts or courts aren't on the same page as corrections, it can lead to conflict. And when we have that conflict, we may not be reaching justice because we're not working together to reach justice. Each agency is just sort of out for themselves and they're not working together with the other parts in order to assure justice. That's more of the conflict model. Okay, now there's one other issue that often comes up with criminal justice, and that is what we call federalism. So federalism is the, well, what is it? Do you know what federalism is? Federalism is the division of power between our federal government, the U.S. government, and our state governments, okay? The federal government often wants the power to tell the states what to do. On the other hand, the states say, we're different than other states. We're different than the whole country. We want to make our own rules. We don't want the federal government telling us what we have to do. So we often have this battle, who should have the final authority on what is just? Should the federal government be able to come in and just tell the states what to do? Or should each individual state kind of get to make their own decisions? And that also causes cons consensus and conflict issues. Sometimes the state and federal government work really well together. You have the FBI and local and state police working together to solve a crime and they share power and they do stuff together. Sometimes the FBI wants to come in and the state say, back up, this is our territory, this is our state. You do not have the right to come in and take over. So that is more of a conflict. So we constantly have this balance back and forth. Who's going to have the power, the federal government or the state government? And if you're watching the news or anything with the Roe v. Wade decision, that's a big issue right now. Should the federal government be able to say you have the right to an abortion or should individual states be able to make that decision? And so that's one of the examples of this conflict between the federal government and the state governments. Okay, so I wanna 
uh, kind of switch topics for a second. I want you to think about this. Billy Bob was hiding in a dark alley one night. Around 2 a.m., a young man, Jerry, walked down the alley after leaving a bar. When he was about halfway down the alley, Billy Bob jumped out and hit Jerry over the head and stole his wallet. And then Jerry awoke. He called the police. So what I want us to think about are what are the steps that the criminal justice process will use to solve and prosecute this crime? So what happens to Billy Bob? So Billy Bob com create, commits a crime. What are the steps in the system that we go through, that Billy Bob will go through in order to assure justice? These are the steps in the criminal justice process. So the first steps you have are the policing steps, okay? So you have an investigation where they go in and they try to figure out what happened. Then they go to court and get a warrant to be able to search or arrest. When they have all the evidence, then they're going to arrest Billy Bob. And then they're going to bring him into the station and they're going to book him, which is making an administrative record that they have taken him into custody, okay? Then we move more into the court stages. So after you're booked, you have to go to court. So in our system, we have what's called the initial appearance. You have to be in front of a judge fairly quickly to be told of the charges and told of your rights. That's your initial appearance. And then the court is going to decide, can you go free until your trial or do are we going to hold you in court? Then we have what's called a preliminary hearing. If you're going to be charged with a misdemeanor, which is a lower level crime in our system, you'll have less than one year in jail for a misdemeanor. They're going to have this little hearing just to make sure that the police do have enough evidence to keep charging you. It's a individual rights protection. We want to make sure we're not putting people in jail, holding them for a long time before their trial. So you're going to have this little preliminary hearing and determine if there's enough uh, evidence to hold you, or I'm sorry, to continue on with the trial. If they decide you have enough evidence, then they'll issue what's called an information, which is your formal charges. If it's a felony, something you could spend more than one year in jail for, in New York, we have what's called a grand jury. So instead of a preliminary hearing in front of a judge, you're going to have a group of people, a grand jury, that's going to look at the evidence and see if there's enough evidence to continue on with the charge. So if the grand jury says there's enough evidence, they issue an indictment. So if it's a preliminary hearing for a misdemeanor, the prosecutor puts the evidence out and the judge decides and it's an information. If it's a felony, the, it goes to a grand jury. And if they think there's enough evidence, then you go to an indictment. If these are the formal charges against Billy Bob now, originally he's arrested on police charges. These are going to be now the formal charges that actually go to court. If you have an information or indictment, then you go to court and you would have what's called an arraignment. This is where the judge tells you the formal charges against you. And this is where you plead guilty or not guilty. If you plead um, guilty, then you just jump to sentencing. You get punished. If you plead not guilty, then you go to a trial where all the evidence is presented and we have to determine beyond a reasonable doubt whether you committed this crime, whether a jury or judge decides that. If they find you guilty, then you go to sentencing where the judge will determine or sometimes a jury will determine what your sentence is. And then if you receive some sort of confinement in jail or prison, then you move into corrections. Okay, so this is just a quick overview. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about these steps in much more detail in Chapter 7, I believe. So I just wanted to introduce you to these concepts in this lecture. Now, throughout all of these steps in the police, courts, and corrections, a huge thing that workers in the system have to understand is the concept of discretion. Discretion is the ability of an individual to make a choice and make a judgment of what should be best in the situation. 
if you are interested in going into criminal justice, you will have a tremendous amount of discretion. You get to make a lot of choices, right? Do you pull the person out? They're going 65 in a 55. Do you pull them over or do you let them go? If you pull them over, do you give them a warning? Do you give them a ticket? If they have a brake light out, do you give them a ticket for that or just a warning? Do you arrest them? So there's tons of discretionary choices that are made within the criminal justice system. So you just need to understand what discretion is. It's when you work in the system, you have the ability to make choices that are going to affect the rest of the system. So when we give tremendous discretion, we want to make sure that they do it properly. So police receive an anonymous tip that an eighth grade student is using a photo vault app to share inappropriate photos. After an investigation, a sexting scandal was discovered with many students involved. So students were sending naked pictures to other students. That's child pornography, which is a crime. So it is a C felony. It's considered child porn to share naked photos with someone under 18. So the person in the photo is under 18. You are the police. What are your options? So I want you to think about it. If you were the police officer, first identify what are some of your choices? What are your discretionary choices? What can you do in this situation? Once you list what your choices are, then I want you to decide which one of those choices would you make, which what would you ultimately do in this situation? So we have to think about what guided your choice, what guided your discretion? Well, a lot of times it's ethics. So ethics are the moral principles that direct what's right and wrong. And we have professional ethics. So you would learn within your profession, what are the guidelines that are going to govern your discretionary choices? So it's what you personally think are right and wrong and what your profession um, puts around as guidelines to help form your discretion. So we will talk a lot about discretion with police, with courts and corrections throughout the semester. And we'll also talk about how ethics will help shape each of those things. So the last thing I wanna talk about is what we call evidence-based practice in criminal justice. So basically how criminal justice system works is we don't just make a choice to do something. We're just going to start um, uh, DWI checkpoints. We have to base it on evidence. So criminal justice is now considered a social science. It's a social science because we are going to make rational choices, discretionary choices on what to do based on evidence and research, okay? So we're going to socially, scientifically test strategies and policies and see if they are working. So a lot of times now you see police departments working hand in hand with grad students, and doctoral students to research different policies to see if they are good policy and then implementing them if the social science research supports those ideas. So it's scientifically supported crime fighting. It's not just a whim, we're just gonna do this. We wanna support it with actual evidence. So we have a crime fighting strategy that we wanna try. We send it to an institution to do social science research, surveys, um, data analysis. We review that data and that evidence and we decide, is it scientifically supported that we should move forward with this policy? This is what we call smarter policing. We want to make choices based on scientific social science evidence when we are deciding what our policy should be. So we're gonna look at this later throughout the semester. This is gonna be sort of the basis for your second project, your comparative studies project. You're going to just think about the concept of social science and how you could scientifically test different um, police strategies to see if they work.
Okay, oops, I forgot. Click through it. Okay, so that's all I have. So just a quick review. I have this little fill in the blank. So spend a few minutes, you can stop the video, spend a few minutes trying to fill in the blank and see if you understand the concepts that when I went over. And when you're ready, you can start the video again and I'll show you the answers. So the crime control model of criminal justice places emphasis on apprehension and conviction of criminal suspects. In contrast, the due process model in the, uh, emphasizes individual rights over the powers of the state. On September 11, 2001, the pendulum swung towards crime control as our government responded to the challenges of fighting acts of violence motivated by political grievances known as terrorism. So hopefully you understand some of those concepts. So that's all I have for chapter one. So hopefully now you're all set. Make sure you go into Brightspace and you complete the chapter one discussion and the chapter one assignment. Also make sure that you are registered for MindTap and that you've taken chapter one exam based on the chapter reading for MindTap. If you have any questions, reach out. I'll be happy to work with you and help you with anything you need. If you're confused about the organization of the class, let me know. We can just spend a few minutes. I can explain it very quick. Once you get it, it will make a lot of sense to you. Um, but otherwise, good luck, and I will see you again next week. Bye.